if I really want to understand bears, then I need to understand all the things around bears so I can understand bears better. Mm. And maybe the way you get fisheries people to play with you is you go, in order to understand fisheries better, you need to understand bears. But then there's the next level that comes past that, and that's what synthesis is really about, going, what things do we understand that are not really about bears and fish that happen when we understand something about both bears and fish? And that's where synthesis comes in. And it's that next generation of interdisciplinary thought that isn't just realizing that my field can benefit from your field, but starts becoming truly transdisciplinary and starts going, what is our field, even if we have individual subfields or individual entire disciplines that are ours? What happens when we put those together and think of that not as a, a mutual benefit to isolated things, but as this one unified thing? Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. I am back at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville on the beautiful campus here, listening to a very loud bird uh, <laughs> <laughs> signaling. He sounds sounds like a horny male up there. Uh, maybe a territorial uh, situation. Anyway, lovely ambient sounds, um, beautiful scenery, and I'm getting to talk in person to one of my favorite here we are guests uh who's been on the show multiple times so happy to have her back nina pfefferman is joining me thank you for having me nice to see you in person yes oh it's so wonderful well we first met in person we doing stand-up science a while. it was 2019 i feel like That's it was fantastic. fall 2019 i think so um you gave a great talk we went to we uh went to dinner as well and i was just doing like three cities a week meeting two scientists in every city and i just, became a huge fan instantly uh, <laughs> i mean i barely remember any of the shows that I did <laughs> because it was like such a whirlwind and I met so many interesting people and then COVID came around and I was like, wait a second, did I talk to someone who did some talk about mathematically modeling pandemics? And I remembered you because you were such an incredible communicator, reached out and and uh, been on the show a few times. Now we're friends. It's terrific. It's, Great I'm to very see grateful. you. So what um, uh, so first of all, let's just assume no one's seen you on the show sure. uh, before. Uh, we have some new listeners or whatever tuning in. Um, why don't you set up for people a bit of your background and what you do? Of course. So um I am a mathematical modeler, which means that what I do is I use the language and tools of mathematics to tell stories. And if I tell the stories well enough, we learn from the stories, kind of the same way that fables teach you a moral. Uh, and that can be um, a, an ethical or morality tale uh, in a fable, and you learn that from a fictional story. Math tells a rigorous quantitative story, but it's in the same way you can learn abstractions and insights from that mathematics. And I apply that to study the intersection between behavior and infectious disease. So how do people feel about infectious diseases? What choices do they make as a result? And then how does that change the course of transmission dynamics in a population to shape an outbreak? And of course, the last couple so of years, it's very been easy, relevant. is what you're saying. <laughs> there's, uh, there's hardly anything to consider. You throw a few numbers yeah. down, easy peasy. You completely understand how the human condition is going. The many Definitely. ways in which the human condition is going to interact with a <laughs> new disease threat and potential policy changes, etc. Oh, absolutely. So easy. Well, but so honestly, some of it really is. Some of it really is very easy. Some of the deep insights around pandemics and outbreaks are things that fourth grade math could show you. Yeah. You have to be able to think about the fourth grade math in the right way to realize like, oh, that does say that. Mm -hmm. But but um, the math doesn't have to be complicated to get beautiful insight. On the other hand, there are questions, as you suggest, of, oh, now we bring in policy and now we bring in nuanced behaviors and now we bring in the social construction of risk perception. Mm -hmm. And 
how I calibrate my understanding of risk by how my friends are calibrating their understanding of risk. Yeah. And when you start bringing that in, the math does get more complicated and then it becomes a little trickier and fourth graders are no longer the appropriate level of mathematician to handle that. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit difficult because um, math... It, ma <sighs> Hmm. I don't know how to phrase this because I well, what I was about to say is math doesn't come terribly intuitive to humans. I'm not sure if that's true. Uh, I, I I think some math does, and then uh, well, okay. So here's uh, yeah, I'm biased. Are, yeah. I'm totally okay. biased. I love math, um, but I Me would too. I would early in life have identified as someone who wasn't good at math. Okay, and I do currently have the ego to say that I'm I am good at math, uh -huh. but. I think that, that there are things about math that are native to humans. I think yeah. the way humans think is about relationships and, and making things quantitative isn't unnatural to people going, this one's bigger or this one's smaller or you know what, it's going up. I don't know how quickly it's going up. Oh, maybe I do know how quickly it's going up. I don't know how big it is, but I know it's increasing really fast. Mm. Those are all very rigorous quantitative concepts that we have language for in mathematics. Now, what we're not so good at is the careful and detailed manipulation of the representations of mathematics that allow us to interrogate those systems in a scientific and then logical way to make hypotheses like, I think, I think that this is always going to be true. Let me see if I can prove it. Or let me see if I can calculate it. Let me see what the number is on Tuesday. Or is the number bigger or smaller on Tuesday than on Monday? Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things, I think it takes practice. And I think in the same way that we wouldn't say humans are natively bodybuilders, but we do say, oh, humans have muscles and they can natively do stuff. And if they do stuff a lot, they get stronger. Mm -hmm. um, I think math is very much like that. There's a, a particular skill set and toolkit that we are all born with the ability to develop. And not everybody can be Arnold Schwarzenegger. No, not everybody who bodybuilds is going to wind up being award an award-winning lifter or or sculpted body but everybody can get really really strong if they put their mind to it mm. um and and you don't want to break yourself i think i think math can emotionally traumatize people in the same way that like lifting badly can sprain uh your body um so i think you need good instruction that supports you mm. but i think it's a matter of internal drive and see seeing why you would want to do it the same way that like i am not i am not a bodybuilder um, mm -hmm. But I have lots of faith that if I decided for myself that I wanted to get stronger, I could get myself a trainer. That trainer could teach me what would work for me and I could practice and I would get stronger. Um, I would probably never become a competitor as an athlete, but you don't have to to think that you're good at something. Mm. All right. I'm, I'm probably not going to do it professionally. Most people aren't going to be professional mathematicians, but most people do what we call sort of quantitative reasoning. They just don't think of it as math when they do that. Can you give an example? Sure. So, so quantitative reasoning can be as simple as going, oh, I only have so many hours in a day. What's worth it to me to spend my time doing? And sometimes we even talk about that as mindfulness, right? We talk about that as, as living purposefully or with intent and not just going, oh, I ran out of time today. I, this, I, what I spent my time doing is not what I would have wanted to do if I'd planned it. Um, going, going back and revising and going, okay, I have an allocation in the language of math. I have a resource allocation problem. I have a constrained resource, which is time. I have a certain amount of time to allocate to these different things. And I have costs and benefits to putting my time into these different things. And I'd like, maybe I don't want to fully optimize it. I don't want to sit down and work out like, okay, I'm going to spend 27 minutes on this and three minutes on that and five minutes, but we can do sort of a relative problem and go, I'm about willing to spend an hour or so per day on this or just an hour this week on this or I don't really want to spend an hour on this, but the friendship asking me for it is worth it. I'm going to do it. Mm. Um, those are actually still we don't think of them as quantitative problems, but they are actually a, a heuristic. So so there is sort of a filter in how humans think that we're not sitting down and solving a math problem in the traditional sense, but we're using the same quantitative reasoning, the same intuition and heuristic. Or, or another, another wonderful one is going like, should I bring an umbrella with me today? Is it going to rain? Maybe someone is listening to a weather report that gives them a percentage probability of rain. Um, maybe someone is just sort of squinting out their window and being like, nah. Um, but all of that is based on 
your experience up to date. So you're forming sort of a scientific hypothesis of when I've seen conditions like this before, I think that the likelihood of this happening is worth it for me to bring an umbrella or not worth it for me to bring an umbrella. Mm -hmm. And maybe that has to do with whether or not your umbrella is by the door. If it's easy to grab an umbrella, maybe you're more likely to do it. Um, so that's, again, it's a sort of cost-benefit analysis. And so I think math is really all about framing. And this is also why when I say, when I introduced myself, I said I'm a mathematical modeler. Modelers are exactly the mathematicians who will tell you that this kind of storytelling made rigorous is mathematics. There are definitely mathematicians who are like, if I have not written down a rigorous proof system with a QED at the end, it is not yet mathematics. There's room for all of us. Okay. I Well, now I'm... See, I, I, I've I, gone from... At first, I was like, oh, math really is intuitive. And then you're kind of describing how we all um, calculate uh, you know, various costs and benefits and uh, throughout the day. And then I thought... Yeah, I guess I'm not very good at math. I actually thought that I was better at math until I heard you explain <laughs> oh, no. it like that, and now, <laughs> and now I'm like, well, I, oh. I, I guess I guess I'm I'm good at math. I'm bad at executing uh, math in the. I I'm bad at accepting the results well, of, of of the math. Sometimes. Well, so but also the, I would draw a distinction between the outcome working. Yeah, and right. The right. reasoning that went behind it. And so I think right. what it is is that many people are intuiting the quantitative reasoning that they're doing and they're not making it explicit. When you when someone says, Oh, do I want to get an umbrella today? They're not thinking to themselves, wait, let me do math. Mm. Nor should they. That would be crazy. Even I don't do that. And I love math. Um, but what you're doing is still the sort of reasoning, even if you're doing it in a split second and calling it a gut reaction. Yeah. And and doing that and being good at it is different from always getting the right answer. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the important thing about math, especially the storytelling parts of math, are to tell the stories that lead you to understand what went into the decisions. Mm. And it's very much less about the calculation being correct, getting you to the right number or the right answer, as it is understanding, oh, this is the right process. And then if you have the right process, then with, with either practice or help or checking your work a lot on different days when your brain is clear, you can figure out if you have the right answer. Mm. But the important thing is to get to the right process. And I, I, think, I think mathematical thinking and quantitative reasoning, that's the thing that you practice, that's the process. And so that's also, I think, what we screw up in teaching math, especially to little kids. It takes a while to figure out what math is because we start by teaching calculation. And we call it math and we say, oh, first you have to learn how to add things and then you have to learn how to divide things. And then maybe we teach you about f ratios and fractions and then maybe we teach you how to divide fractions and then we teach you trigonometry and then maybe we teach you geometry or calculus. And geometry starts getting close to quantitative reasoning and but it's usually taught so badly that people hate it. They're like, oh, God, this is a whole new and different thing. And I don't see how it because they're right. I don't see how it relates necessarily to what I've learned before in math. I don't understand why figuring out how to bisect the angle with ruler and compass is suddenly relating to what is X in a linear equation. Uh, and the answer is there is a way to relate them and it's beautiful, but that part is the math you don't even see till after. Mm. And up until then, we've just taught people how to calculate stuff. And even in calculus, literally calculus from calculating, we're just teaching people this very careful method of, oh, here's how you get the answer but you're not yet doing the quantitative reasoning of why do you get the answer from doing that? And that's math that you start seeing if, if you're dedicated enough to keep taking it in college, you start to see it in advanced math courses in college, but you wow. don't really get to see it even until really advanced math courses in undergraduate or graduate school, which is terrible because math is gorgeous and we don't even tell people what it is until after they would have to slog through like 10 years of calculating shit. How could we instead start earlier in instructing instructing kids about math from the onset to uh, be, because the in school people will be like, when am I ever going I to use this? this? So, right. And I always I liked math. And so it was like, well, all of the time I always kind of even even in stand up comedy, I always thought. Like I didn't write out formulas, but everything felt, felt. formulaic. You even <laughs> say that. You even say like uh, as a 
as a comedian, you'll watch like a, a TV show or something like that that feels formulaic. Mm -hmm. And and there is some sort of formula going on there. Yes. And there's a pacing thing and there's a Pattern. building of tension that you're yes. kind of measuring and and uh, and 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 you're calculating, um, you know, laugh decibels or, or things like that. there. There really is a lot of calculations going on. And I and because I I liked thinking through things mathematically that I more consciously thought about things in that way. But lots of lots of comedians do it without ever. They would never frame it as sure. math. Sure. So so I think. I think even the comedians that wouldn't frame it as math mm -hmm. would think of it as a pattern right? and would rely because humans, this is where humans natively do this all the time. Humans like to rely on structure and we see patterns in lots of things. If we look at, at a repeating, if we look at nature and we see something that repeats, we go, oh, that's, that's repeating. Like, why is it? If we're scientists, we go, why is it repeating? If we're mathematicians, we go, can I show how repeating is, is going to be useful? Um, or can I, can I characterize something about that repeating and then generalize from it so that it's not just that pattern that repeats, but I understand why patterns like it repeat. Is there something stable about the emergence of the structure that leads to that pattern? Um, so I think how we would communicate it in schools is first of all, to acknowledge that not everything is useful. Some things are beautiful and they're worthwhile to be beautiful because I think we do ourselves a disservice if we tell people math is just about being useful or just about being beautiful. Um, and I think especially we lose generations of mathematicians. That's, that's to me the, the actual tragedy of this. People know whether or not they can calculate things early, but people who might love being mathematicians and bring a greater richness to our field never get the chance to see why they might like it because they don't like calculating. And it would be like, imagine someone said to you, you could grow up to be an artist, but before we ever show you any art or tell you that artists can do that, first, you just need to paint lots of tiles really beautifully because somewhere out there is someone who's going to put together a mosaic out of your tiles. Trust us, it's related to art. There is an artist doing things with mosaics. You can spend about six years perfecting your tile painting. Some people will still do that, especially if, as we do with math and society, we tell them, you're smart if you can paint tiles well. I mean, you're not, certainly you're not stupid if you can paint tiles well, but maybe it's not the best measure of intellect. Because um, there's diversity in that, right? But also it's seeing the value proposition. It's why would I ever take the next course if all I have to do is, if all I'm doing is getting slightly better at painting tiles? Why would I, why would I do this to myself? Yeah. Whereas instead, like, we never tell a 10 year old, oh, well, if you aren't beautiful as a painter yet, you can't be a painter. We do say you need technique. You need to practice. There are things you need to learn. I'm, I'm not a good artist, so I'm not saying this from personal experience. No one ever said to me, oh, practice this. <laughs> but I have seen talented kids who clearly exhibit the desire and the, the framing of how they think about what they would want to do as an artist a musician, a painter, a comedian, and go, I, I think I'm making people laugh really well. I think I'm engaging them. I think I'm getting them to think about something and then enjoy it, right? As it probably, I don't know, maybe you were a prodigy, but probably at 10, you weren't as good a comedian as you were later in life. Correct. <laughs> okay, awesome. But you knew what it was you were going for. Right? I don't even know if you wanted to be a comedian at 10. But like, I did. Excellent, yeah. see? Um, but you could envision what that looked like. We don't even tell people what it is to be a mathematician other than some crazy eccentric talking about objects that don't really exist and then it involves equations and like solving for X for something. Um, and the real answer is it's about thinking about the rules that guide logic and how to apply those rules to objects in mathematical theory and thinking, okay, well, numbers are an example of a mathematical object, but they're not the only mathematical object. And what do we actually know from what we've already said about numbers? We made some assumptions about numbers. Um, some of them we can prove from other assumptions we've made, and some of them we just axiomatically go, we're just going to assume that. Now what can we do with this? Um, and building from that and poking at it and going, wait, does that, does that mean things about geometry? Does that mean things about patterns and tessellations? Does it mean things about fractals where you can zoom in or zoom out and get the same pattern? 
Does it mean something about infinity? Um, infinity itself is a, a really cool concept. I think we could excite kids with it. And I have absolutely gone into elementary schools and shown them the proof, the mathematical proof, that there are different sizes of infinity. Mm -hmm. It's not actually a very complicated proof. It's, it's due to a brilliant mathematician named Cantor. Um, and it takes maybe 10 minutes to wrap your mind around the storytelling about sizes of infinity. And as long as you have seen the math, the calculation math, that lets you get to the number line and knowing the difference between a real number that can have an infinite number of decimal points and an integer that, ha that stops it at the decimal point and like everything else goes zero forever. As long as you know that distinction between those two things, you can use that allegory, that analogy of numbers to say things that are mathematically provable and rigorous about different sizes of infinity. Mm. And it's beautiful. And we don't even tell kids that that's what math actually is. Mm. So give me a few more examples like that of, of, of things that you could that you could tell to uh, again, uh, because we early on in this, you you mentioned and I, I know you've mentioned um, multiple times in, in past appearances that a lot of these concepts can be broken down in a way that a fourth grader can understand. And, and, and this isn't, this isn't to, uh, to say, by the way, like, why aren't you getting this? A fourth grader could understand it in, 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 in uh, like a condescending way. This, this is, this is just that it, it just requires just a little bit of willingness yeah. um, and and um, openness to uh, and and someone that's good enough at communicating in that way so that yeah. they uh, a fourth grade. But we that is to say that all of us are perfectly equipped to get these concepts if, if we allow ourselves and work together with people to learn Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And, and also, it's, it's not just about finding someone who's good at communicating. It's about someone finding someone who's good at communicating to you. Mm -hmm. So, right, art is a beautiful way to learn about the human condition. But not every playwright speaks to every audience. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to learn about suffering and unrequited love, some people go to Shakespeare, some people go to rap, right? But, but different artists can communicate that same aspect of the human condition and you can learn and enrich your life by hearing that communication. But, but if you're someone who natively goes like, oh, no, someone speaking to me in, in a common day language that I, that I feel and that, with a, a beat and a pattern that's capturing my, my heart rate and, and flowing through me with music, that's someone who can teach me about suffering. And, and like Shakespeare, like, no, I, don't, I, don't, I can see it, but I don't, I don't learn it. I don't get it. Whereas there are other people who go, oh, the, the lyrical language of Shakespeare and this, and it's somewhat removed from my experience because it was written hundreds of years ago, but it's the uni universality of the human condition. Um, in the same way, different teachers teach math in different ways and different types of math lead to different ways of thinking. Math has subdisciplines that actually have a really hard time talking to each other because it's a way of arranging how you think about these mathematical objects. And it's really hard to learn from another mathematician in a different discipline mm. because the things that come out as salient, the things that are the important object characterizations that that field thinks about aren't the ones in your field. And you go, wait, why would you even, why would you even do that that way? And that's, that feels like I've been twisted into a pretzel and then asked to do a, like a jumping jack. What did you just do to me? Um, so it's not just about the willingness to put in the effort. It's also about finding the right language and teacher to communicate to you. But backing up to your question also about like what else could a fourth grader learn? Um, so I'm going to run home to, to mama on my field. Um, a fourth grader can learn fundamentally beautiful things about epidemic outbreaks. Um, so, for example, one thing that you and I have talked about and that for a little while, a couple years ago, the whole country was talking about was this idea of flattening the curve of you, we can together change our behavior in a way that's going to decrease the number of people who are sick at any one time. That was a huge deal and that's a huge important actual practical implication of something very easy and mathematical that we don't even need. I mean, I, I have in the past done things like um, webinars on here's the equation for this, but we don't even need those. You and I could just talk about it at the level a fourth grader could understand and it'll be instantly obvious both why it's true and also 
how math shows it to be true or how mathematical reasoning shows it to be true. And then if we needed to calculate the exact numbers, we would go to the equations. So here's the story. We're going to understand something really basic about infectious diseases, and that is that healthy people catch infectious diseases from sick people. That is the definition of infectious disease. It's not too creative or out on a limb to assume that. So we're going to assume that. The only way to catch an infectious disease is to catch it from a sick person. And then for purposes of this idea of flattening the curve, what we're going to do is say, for at least a little while after you recover from being a sick person, you can't catch the disease again. You can get back to being healthy, but you have some immune protection, or, and whether or not that's because you have immune memory, or you're just, your immune system is still ramped up, your, uh, your innate immune system is still ramped up and protecting you from just all comers, because you're like, oh God, to the battlements, um, which does happen. It's, it's shorter than adaptive immunity, but but it is hard to reinfect you right after you've recovered from something because all of your immune function is ramped up to try and deal with it. Mm. So we're gonna have then three classes of people. We're gonna have healthy, susceptible people who can catch the disease, infected, infectious people who have the disease and can give it to other people, and recovered people who had the disease and now can't catch it again. Yeah. Okay, so now just starting to think about this in quantitative reasoning and in the storytelling, well, how do we get more people tomorrow sick than today, right? Just, just when it's increasing. When is that number increasing? It's increasing when there's more potential, uh, when there's more sick people. Um, and let's see. And, and there's uh, an, enough healthy people to become yes. infected by those, uh, by those sick people. So, as the number of people that have been infected increases, the number of potential people that can be infected can decrease and... Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's the whole story. You just solved a differential equation mm -hmm. without even knowing it. Or maybe you did know it and you're cheating and giving me some help. Thank you. <laughs> um, but exactly that story, yeah. right? When is the number of, of sick people tomorrow increasing? The answer is, well, we have to have some sick people mm -hmm. to infect other people. But... We really need to have a giant puddle of healthy people that they can go out and recruit. Mm -hmm. They think of it like a Ponzi scheme, right? We I think we've talked about this a little bit before. And I'm not I sure we also... framed it as a Ponzi scheme because that's fun, and I feel like I would have uh, I would have remembered. No, yeah, so, so I don't think we used exactly that phrasing, but we talked about recruitment. We talked right, about right. this idea yes. of more bringing more people in. And I think actually if you you hooked me up in a conversation with a friend of yours where we might actually have used Ponzi scheme as a as a phrase, uh -huh. but. Um, the, the idea works, right? You're going out and you're recruiting people to your cause. You're getting them sick. Mm -hmm. When everyone already agrees with you, there's no one to recruit. Yeah. Um, so when, it's, when an epidemic, when an outbreak is going to grow the most is when you've got some sick people. You need the sick people because if you don't have any, no one is catching the disease. Mm -hmm. But you need a lot of people who have never had the disease and can catch it. Mm -hmm. That's when you get an outbreak. Now... That's also how you realize that flattening the curve is something that we can do because if you slow down how quickly you recruit healthy people into being sick, then the rate at which you're growing the outbreak is slower. Right. It doesn't mean that fewer people will get sick. It just means that it's slower. Yeah. If it's slower, that gives all the currently sick people time to recover. If they move out of being currently sick, that means that there are fewer people who are sick right now and that whole idea of flattening the curve is minimize the number of total people who are sick right now who might need access to health care and mm -hmm. strain the system all at the same time. Yeah. So you and I just use quantitative reasoning at kind of the level of a fourth grader of just, oh, well, yeah, you got to go recruit your friends. And if everybody already believes you, there's no one to recruit. And if no one believes you yet and you're really good at recruiting, you can recruit lots of people. Right. Um, and if, you know, maybe you've, just gotten the idea. So maybe we just translate it fully into memes. Like everyone's seen the meme. You can't forward it to your friends and have them give you credit for showing them the meme if they've already all seen it. Mm -hmm. Everyone then gets bored of the meme. No one circulates it anymore. Those are your recovered people. Right, right, right. That's all quantitative reasoning and math. And we can put equations to it to calculate the exact numbers. But the important part about it isn't even really the exact number. Sometimes it is. If the answer is how many hospital beds do you need? The exact numbers are quite important. Getting the calculation right is important. But separately from that, just having the insight 
that, for example, an outbreak of an infectious disease that has immunity will eventually die out and can happen again. But you're not going to stay at a high level of infected people all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a mathematical result. That's a provable mathematical result. Not only can I calculate it, I can explain why. That's what we mean in math when we say it's a proof. I can explain why in a way that is logically so sound that there's no other alternative. That's another way of saying that we've proven something. That's also why in science we tend not to say we've proven something. So putting on my science hat for a second bugs the living daylights out of scientists that we miscommunicate sometimes to the public when we say, oh, we don't have proof for this. Right. The, what the public sometimes hears is, oh, then they don't know. And the answer yeah, is... Yeah, well, no one knows everything. Or it's like, well, if, if they don't... If it's not perfect, then there's no one, uh, everyone's on the same playing field in terms of what knowledge they have or what proof or evidence that they have. Oh, it drives me crazy because what what we've done is train scientists that they're not mathematicians, which they're not. I know. When a mathematician says I've proven something, it means there is no possibility that anything else could happen. Right. This is true with a capital T. I have... I have calculated it or I have shown the logic behind it in a way that is unassailable. There's no other possibility. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we don't understand things that we can't prove. We cannot prove gravity. Mm -hmm. I am still dead sure about gravity. Mm -hmm. I don't know why gravity. Physicists don't quite know why gravity. I am still sure of gravity. Mm -hmm. Right. So speaking of um, synthesizing math with uh, with real world uh, um, uh, patterns, Mm -hmm. uh, can you... Introduce what NIMBIOS is. Absolutely. Thank you. So NIMBIOS is the National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis. It is, an, it is a truly international institute that lives here at University of Tennessee. Um, it was originally established with a fund from the National Science Foundation uh, to be a synthesis center. Now, so what a synthesis center from NSF is, they're brilliant. Everyone should want to go visit one, um, is uh, the National Science Foundation itself looks at the state of research and goes... You guys have generated a lot of either data or insight or research, but you've been running so far fast to, to figure out the new things that you really maybe haven't stopped yet to figure out what you, all of the different rich things you can learn from putting them together as you learn them. Mm-hmm. So you've been running in this straight line. Maybe stop and like amble a bit and see what else you've learned on the way and put it together and really synthesize it and find synergy. Figure out which things come together to give better understanding of the world, not just in the direct thing you were going after, but by putting all the pieces together. So, uh, my, some of my, my colleagues, uh, I was not here when, when UT got the center. Can I, can I give you an example of, uh, I, I heard, uh, ju- just yesterday, um, I was, I was talking with someone who used to study bears. He, he just retired recently. Um, and, and so he's, he was a scientist for a very, very long time. Um, and, and back in the day, he used to study bear, bears and he couldn't even cooperate with uh, fishery. Like oh. people that studied fish would be like, why would we care about oh, bear bears. research? <laughs> and people who like, study bears bear, fish. Yeah. Like, right. why do we care about fish <laughs> research? And, and so, so this is a, at least in, in terms of over the last, uh, probably 80, 60 years, something like that. 60 years ago, interdisciplinary science was not something that people seemed to care much about. And really, even until the last few decades, it doesn't seem like there was much of an effort made in my in my limited understanding of the of the history of science and so this is this is continuing to be a a growing field and i i I suppose it's it's just once you show the usefulness of of uh of new systems of thinking and researching things and collaborating then more funding comes in more uh more benefits come from that and so on and so forth yeah, and the community of thinkers grows. Mm-hmm. So, so funding is nice, and, and absolutely, I will never, I will never stop being grateful to to the funding agencies that give us the money to have the time and focus the energy to do this. But really, the, what the what the money does is buy everybody enough breathing room in their research to get creative and to help them go like, oh, I can think about this this way, and then build the community of scholarship that sees value in that interdisciplinarity. 
-hmm. and brings their voice to it also. So it's not just then bear researchers and fisheries researchers. It's also uh, environmental uh, contaminant chemists and it's bird researchers and it's um, uh, st water flow researchers who work right. on streams, limnologists, and it's and take your pick and just bring everybody to the table and go like, oh, now we understand how the system works. It's not just about so right. The, the first pass of this is just going as a bear researcher, and now I, I don't know who, with whom you were speaking, so I hope I'm representing them well. But the very first flavor could be if I really want to understand bears, then I need to understand all the things around bears so I can understand bears better. Mm. And maybe the way you get fisheries people to play with you is you go, in order to understand fisheries better, you need to understand bears. But then there's the next level that comes past that, and that's what synthesis is really about, going, what things do we understand that are not really about bears and fish that happen when we understand something about both bears and fish? Mm -hmm. And that's where synthesis comes in. And it's that next generation of interdisciplinary thought that isn't just realizing that my field can benefit from your field, but starts becoming truly transdisciplinary and starts going, what is our field? Even if we have individual subfields or individual entire disciplines that are ours, mm -hmm. what happens when we put those together and think of that not as a, a mutual benefit to isolated things, but as this one unified thing? Right. A, a, a thing that comes to mind is is the is the stress response in both predator and prey, where if all you studied was prey, you, you would be like, well, something's chasing after you. You have this stress response and here's what's ha happening. And then if you just study predators, you would go, well, if you're running after something, you have this stress response and here's what, and it might not ever occur to you to, uh, to ask the other person. And, and, and then you, but if you did, you would find out that it's actually the exact same stress response. It's the same hormones being released, the same kind of energy delegation that's happening. Mm -hmm. And to think of that as a physiologic, a fundamental physiological process in response to a stressor, as opposed to the stress of something trying to eat you or the stress of you need to eat something or you'll starve. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Absolutely. To, to, and that's, that's very mathematical, right? What you just did was look at two different instances of the same pattern and abstract the logic and go, oh, maybe there's a thing called a stressor. Mm -hmm. And that thing called a stressor leads to these patterns of endocrine release and energy utilization and, uh, and how physiological systems process that. Maybe that abstract thing is a common commonality that we can then apply to different, and maybe then we can talk about heat stress. And maybe then we can talk about psychological stress. And maybe then we can talk about, and so maybe we can generalize from that insight to different sources of stressors. And maybe it's not just about a physiological uh, response of I'm running or I'm starving or I'm starving and I'm running or I'm running. Maybe it's I'm running and I'm scared. Um, and so, so I think what you just did also is very beautiful quantitative reasoning of taking that, that it's science. It's absolutely science to make the hypothesis, but it's also mathematical in the sense of identifying and abstracting the core skeleton of the organism and right. going, What's the, what's the foundational logic on which this hinges? How do, I, how do I know which things are just intrinsically true and which things are just the trappings of this particular scenario in this particular right. case? That abstraction is absolutely math. And how do you get down to the bottom? Of it? Is, it, is it through, is, is, is it just through kind of, um, uh, Lots of different people, people, lots of di different experts in lots of different fields, kind of just getting together and uh, sitting around a table and and comparing what they do until a couple people have an insight and go. Actually, it seems like this is we're talking about the same thing here. There's something um, transcendent about this that that applies to uh, mul these multiple fields of research that we do. So not to sound too ridiculous, but the answer is, yeah, that's exactly what it is. But as with everything else, it's a practiced skill that you get better at sitting in those groups of people going, maybe this is the underlying skeleton. Maybe this is the core abstraction. 
And then you, you propose it and someone goes, nah, that's not true in my system. And you go, wait, well, is it not true in your system because it doesn't apply to your system or because it was the wrong abstraction for these other systems? And then, so, then you do get practice at the people in the room talking with each other in ways that actually communicates. It's very easy to talk past each other a lot. And, uh, and this is where I think Nimbios is fantastic. Um, Nimbios is really practiced at First of all, we have a lot of old hands now. Nimbios is, has been around for more than a decade. Um, and when we first started, the, some of the brilliance of, so the, the original proposal was led by a man named Lou Gross. He's amazing. Um, but part of what he proposed was a, a really intense focus on working groups, on groups of 10 to 15 people coming together from these different fields to have those conversations. And then paying some attention to what worked and what didn't in being able to make those abstractions. And some of the groups crashed and burned. And some of the groups took off and flew and redefined entire disciplines. And I think both of them, like even the ones that crashed and burned, were incredibly important to Nimbios. I mean, I, I thought I've, it, that really grabbed me um, when you were kind of first setting this up, the the idea of buying people the the space, basically, the the time and, and, and the, the freedom to make some mistakes. And, and I, I mean, it's so... I. I hope that um, I, I just got back from this um, zombie apocalypse medicine meeting oh, at awesome. uh, Arizona State University, and the and the whole theme is is uh, this woman Athena Actipus uh, studies cancer and cooperation, and so it's basically her whole thing is well, how can we? Uh, we're, we're well, one people are fascinated by shows like The Walking Dead and stuff like that. So oh, sure. how can we? How can we use things like that to introduce some fun scientific concepts wow. about, like, say, you know, viruses uh, can uh, have zombie-like behavior, things like that? But, but I think one of the important parts of it is um, we're facing all of these uh, issues, and they are serious, and there's a zillion different apocalypse-ish scenarios. But uh, what one of her one of her main things is, but how can we still figure out a way to have fun within that space? Because play is such an important part of problem solving. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think there's a lot of joy, especially so people who wind up scientists and mathematicians. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of joy in puzzling things out. There's there's right there's many images in in art and society about like the the troubled eccentric researcher being like, oh, this is I'm thinking and it's terrible and I don't understand yet. And then the joy of realizing it. I think the part people miss is there's real joy in the act of being confused mm -hmm. and going, all right, I, I don't get this. I why why on earth is this happening? And you come talk to me about the parts you understand and I'll tell you about the parts I understand. And what the hell? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it is speculative and it is it can be high risk from the perspective of demonstrating progress in a way that articulates like, well, why was it useful to understand? Why was it useful to understand why bears and fish need to be studied together? And the answer sometimes is sometimes we don't realize why things are useful until after we've got them. Sometimes they're not useful, but the conversational process of figuring them out gives us a template for how to do that better in the future. And sometimes the thing that's the most useful is the internal transition and in how each scientist in the room thinks about their own problems and then reframes those problems so that they can generalize to different things. So it can be very much about solve this problem, solve many problems, or just internally, oh, now I solve problems differently. And all of those are beautiful. And, and synthesis is about that, uh, not just mathematical and biological synthesis, which is what we do at NoBios, but all ideas of synthesis and synergy, building something that's bigger than the sum of the parts. And it is just practice. It is, it's really hard for people, so especially scientists, because we have to be so well trained to ask disciplinary questions that are very, we're, we're trained how to think in our disciplines. That's, an, that's another thing we do badly for undergraduates. We tell them that education is about information. And it's really not. And, and um, some state legislatures also sometimes get this wrong. Like, it's really great to have skills. It's incredibly important to have understanding and knowledge. But what's in, most important among those three skills, understanding and knowledge, is really the understanding. How do, you, how do you take new information and assimilate it into a worldview that lets you be 
meaningful to yourself and others. Mm -hmm. And so when we teach information in a college course or in a graduate course, we're not teaching it so that you know the information. It's great when you know the information, but you could also look it up or read it or listen to a fun podcast about it. Um, you don't need to take a course in it. What we're doing in courses is showing people how the different disciplines of human thought approach the assimilation of new knowledge. I guess this is what drove me absolutely crazy about school. A lot of things did. Maybe maybe there was no world where I was ever going to be a good student because I, <laughs> I, I, just, I was just a very rebellious uh, kind of contrarian. Uh, I was born that way so so maybe it wouldn't have mattered but one of the things that uh that absolutely drove me insane was just how much kids are tested on their ability to memorize that's it if you if you can remember the year that a certain thing happened or whatever and and this is just this like one-off little memorization task that adds, other than maybe improving your uh, ability to memorize obscure, kind of somewhat useful details, it 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 has it, it adds nothing in it to your ability to uh, better understand the workings of life and and how how to take any kind of new information and do anything with that. So I would I agree, but I would argue uh, just to be partially to be generous, but partially to be realistic. Yeah. I would argue that like calculation for mathematics, there is use to it. Yeah. There's use to remembering some things, not necessarily the whole encyclopedia of stuff you're confronted with, but, but the ability to understand and synthesize does rely on re retaining the gestalt of many of these things. And so dates in history, like no historian is going to tell you that's the important part of history, mm -hmm. but being able to order this happened, right. then this happened, then this happened, lets you start making some hypotheses about how, why did that happen? Oh, well, if it, if it happened after it, it didn't cause it. If it happened before it, it might have caused it. Right, right. Or it might have influenced it. So, so there's some use in this, just like, just like calculation is not about math, dates are not about history, but they help. They can help you construct it. But it's not about which things do, like, can the students spit back. You're absolutely right. That's deeply frustrating for, I think, everybody. It's frustrating for instructors and students to just be like, Okay, I hope what you got out of my class is mem remembering this fact. And you're like, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. what, we, what we hope that our students get out of our classes is figuring out for them which ways of thinking are the ones that work for them. And so if you wind up a biologist, it's because looking at the world in the way that the biological discipline looks at the world and interrogates things and gains new knowledge and aligns theories. That's why you wind up a biologist. If instead you like proving things in this rigorous quantitative way that says, no, no, I don't care about anything that isn't truly logically the exclusive answer. Mm -hmm. Or if it's not, I can show you why it's not. Then you wind up a mathematician. If you like saying those rigorous quantitative things, but about why is the universe on a, on a particulate matter, why do the laws that govern the universe lead to what we see, then you wind up a physicist. If you like how do the, the influences of social movements and human psychology and perspective lead to the the world and the history we see you wind up historian if you like how do we communicate the human experience to each other you wind up some form of artist um, and it's not really even about what you're good at it's about how does your brain align to understand the universe with others who are thinking as well that's a, that's a really interesting take on different fields. It, it'd almost be because as we, as we understand, um, uh, you know, personality differences and things better. It, it, I mean, I, I wonder if this will be, uh, if we'll be able to guide people a little easier in, in the future in, in terms of understanding what people tend to gravitate to and enjoy putting their energy into and maybe understand a little better than other things and guiding them. What kind of personality um, do you see in a uh, biologist, for, for instance? Well, okay, so I want to make one clarifying yeah, statement yeah. if it's okay. So I think there's a distinction between personality right. and how your brain assimilates knowledge. Right. And I think there's room, and I think part of actually what we've done badly in academia is that we've conflated the two. 
So mm-hmm. you're not a, so 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 I want the reason I want to be very clear about it is that I think part of why there have been some populations of people that haven't traditionally been felt welcomed or been welcomed in different disciplines is that conflation of personality with alignment. Mm-hmm. Many different personalities can think about things in the same way and just not have an easy time communicating with each other about it. Mm. But it is true that there are sort of dominant personalities in fields. Biologists tend to be the people who like getting dirty and poking at stuff. Okay. Um, they really like they like asking questions. They are inspired by the world around them as a as an animal. So where physicists are, or chemists are inspired by the world around them as a process, um, biologists tend to be the ones who are like that thing is growing or that thing is moving or or that thing is gooey. Um, and like, I, why, I love gooey things. Why, why is it gooey? Yeah. Um, so biologists tend to really like to muck in and, and explain something experiential about what's growing. And they, they tend to be inspired by the organization of growth. So, um, I think there's a lot of playfulness in biology that isn't necessarily there in other fields, even cellular and molecular biology of, of things where you don't actually get to muck into the goo. It with your hands, but you muck into the goo with your pipette, or you muck into the goo with your PCR machine, um, or or your Illumina sequencer, um, and just going like something about how this is growing is compelling and beautiful, and I want to organize things into what lets them grow or what compromises their growth, and now I don't even mean growth in a in a truly physiological sense. I I, I can mean growth in the broader sense of what lets a population grow, what lets a cell assemble to grow. What lets mitochondria provide energy in this on a cellular level? Um, what lets a liver work and, and grow and grow an organism because it's filtering things? Mm. Um, what lets DNA grow and, and provide mutations? And how does that translate into traits that govern the interactions of cells? Um, biology, I think, is a, is a huge community of people who align into their thinking what lets things... And not all biologists would agree with me. Absolutely not. Um, but the way that we teach people to think, the disciplinary thought about biology that we train people into is the scientific method, absolutely. Make some observations from those observations, make a hypothesis, set up an experiment and test your hypothesis, refine your hypothesis, test it again, see if it applies, and then what, then incorporate that as theory, as not, not proven, but as, as established theory, and then build on that. Mm. It's a, and it's about processes of growth, processes of organization of growth. Mm. Um, and, and we assimilate knowledge in that way. I'm going to put you on the spot a little oh, bit. I hope okay. not too much. <laughs> um, when you mentioned um, uh, in Embios, you had some, uh, some collaborations that uh, didn't amount to anything. And then you had some, some things that really changed a uh, particular field or so. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any examples off the top of your head that you can think of that, that were really impactful or, or, or something that you were just really, really excited about, um, that came out of Nimbios? Sure. So, okay. I'm, uh, you're going to hate me cause I'm going to twist your question into something, um, perspective uh, instead of hate, perspective? hate would be strong if i <laughs> if i just if if in the course of whatever you're about to say i develop a deep hatred of you that would be well, i I, I won't see that to start running so <laughs> yeah, yeah. awesome um so i think i think the most exciting thing really that that has come out of nimbio so far and that i'm excited to to see continue into the future is the shared understanding of which things about transdisciplinary synergistic research are challenging. So I think the, the first ones and the things we learned when they, and I was, I co-led one of the ones that I would view as not one of our best successes. Let's put it that way. Um, and that still produced some nice papers that, that working group that I, that I do not think worked very well, still produced some nice research, but what it, what it didn't do was, figure out how the people who weren't already aligned on questions were going to work well together because it didn't overcome the things that were really challenging. When you get disciplinarily trained scientists into a room, everybody thinks that if they just teach their field enough to everybody else, that they'll see it because their field is everything. And if you just understand this, everything, then 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 you'll know everything. And, and really, so I think part of what Nimbios and the other synthesis centers in the country did Um, and continue to do is 
train and then give people, again, space to practice. And we have NIMBIOS, while it lives at University of Tennessee, has members all over the world, not just the country, but the world, of people who come back again and again to be part of things at NIMBIOS. And that's part of what's exciting about it, not just because we know those people and they're our friends, but because they're the people who have internalized this process of, oh, no, the, the difficult thing about interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary work is not me explaining my field to you and you explaining your field to me and then we learn about it as students and can do something naive in the middle. It's instead this idea of real synthesis and complementarity of what do we need to understand about each other's work that lets us leverage each other as those experts so that I'm not taking the role of a naive person in your field and just bringing my expertise to tinge your field and you're not tinging mine. We're truly going, no, no, what picture can we put together? And it really takes a frame shift in how, in what you want to get out of the conversation and what everybody in the room needs to understand together in order, to, and, and it does, it means that you have to walk in very open. You can't walk in going, I know what I need to get out of you. You're, you're a chemist, I need this answer from you that I don't know how to do because I'm not a chemist. Give me your answer and I can go away. I think there's, there's an, a te native tendency to envision that kind of collaboration. When you go into a room the first couple of times when you're trying to do broad scale synthesis work, to walk in going, I know what I need. I know I can't do it. I have the humility to realize I'm not everything, but I know what I need. And the real thing that NIMBIOS did that I love and that we're carrying forwards now also in other, other institutes and centers that come out of NIMBIOS um, is going, this isn't really even about humility to know what you can't do. It's about humility to, to not know and be comfortable not knowing what the contribution from someone else to how you think should be. You don't know what you don't know. You shouldn't start by saying, you, give me this thing that I know I don't know or this answer that I know I can't get, and then I know what to do with it. The really beautiful successes are when you get lots of people in a room who are just curious what they can do together and then engage and put the work in to establishing a common language that is a little bit about you learn a little bit of my field, I learn a little bit of yours, but it's about the communication instead of the expertise. And then from that communication together, then we can go, okay, now what questions should we be asking together? And that's very different from, I need your field to answer my question. And that's where we start moving towards transdisciplinarity, not just getting a multidisciplinary team together, to address the real richness and complexity of a, a truly single disciplines problem. But that's the thing that I think is most exciting still. Part of why I'm excited to be director of NIMBIOS right now is that we now have this amazing community of scholars across the globe who have been through this, not just at NIMBIOS, but themselves in their own research labs, at other centers and institutes. I spent a lot of time at DIMAX, which wasn't a synthesis center, but was a science and technology center at NSF, and then transitioned to being its own institute. It's an amazing place for mathematicians and computer scientists to do this. Um, there are other places. Um, what used to be the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute and was just renamed, and I'm embarrassed to say that I don't remember the new name, um, but, but at Berkeley, this amazing math institute of people coming together from different disciplines of math to do this. Um, IPAM, those, at UCLA, there are these amazing institutes across the, and I just, I defaulted to the math ones because they're the ones I know the best, but there are ones, NCs, uh, in, in, and uh, I'm going to embarrass my neon uh, networks, and I'm going to embarrass myself if I try and name the biology ones. But the answer is, or a Mathematical Biosciences Institute at Ohio State, these are all places that people have come. Um, Beers, the, the Banff Research Institute in Canada, places that people come purposefully to have these interactions with each other. And part of the reason that I wanted to name check all of them is that they form this beautiful network of thinkers. And they are all focused, NIMBIOS is focused on math bio. So it is true that we don't tend to attract, you know, the sociologists who want to then play with the engineers. We should. We're moving towards that. Uh, we now just launched a phase one pandemic institute just on multidisciplinarity. It's not even yet on pandemics. It's just on multidisciplinarity. And NSF was wonderful and gave us the money and therefore the breathing space to do that. Uh, and I'm so excited. Our kickoff meeting at NSF is next week. Um, but what's really the most successful, beautiful thing about NIMBIOS and all of these institutes is that the people who, who come back to play 
are the ones who have made this transition from I know what I need to I know what I bring and who are really excited to go, I don't know what we can do with what I bring, but I want to find out. Yeah, I, I've uh, I've kind of accidentally um, fell into learning in an interdisciplinary way where when I when I started this show, I, I had things in mind that I wanted to learn about. And I even had people in mind that I wanted to have on the show. But because of the constraints of, well, I knew that I wanted to do it while touring and take advantage of all the traveling that I do to, like, well, I'll just look up random universities. And then from the constraints of, like, much of my life flying by the seat of my pants, especially when we, we first met doing stand-up science in three cities a week and trying to find two. It was just emailing 20 people, hoping two people <laughs> would say yes. Like, oh, what do you do? Okay, yeah, whatever. Here, be on my show. And then, and have it, sometimes having no idea if it was, if, if I will be interested in a subject or whatever. And then uh, I've, I've gotten to learn and then my audience has gotten to learn all sorts of just random stuff where if I would have just kind of been like, oh, who's got the best selling science book this week or something, which there'd be nothing wrong with doing right. that. And no, plenty, that's amazing too, but. Yeah, but, I, but this has forced me to just stumble into the strangest fields of research that I would have never otherwise even thought to or have considered and, and people that have otherwise never had an opportunity to get their research out to the public have been able to. And, and I feel like, uh, listeners have benefited from that. And I, I get a lot of comments. So like, I wouldn't have thought I was going to be interested in that, that subject. And I, I'm shocked at how much I learned from that. Yeah. yeah I'm, that's the beautiful thing now. I think that, that truly that's the promise of the internet also mm -hmm. and, and modern communication systems of, and it was the promise of, of radio. And now we've just moved into like, and you can go back and listen later. But just the true accessibility of the richness of knowledge and what we can create together, right? The transition from web 1.0 to web 2.0 of first it was everything is accessible and then it was everything can be built upon together. Mm. And so I think I think that's really beautiful about what you do. So um, that that leads us nicely into a, a fun way to wrap up, which is what what do you see in the future for Nimbios? What what are you excited about? So the thing I'm most excited about, I mean, okay, personally, I'm really excited to come out of a time in the pandemic when we couldn't assemble. Because as much as I love the accessibility that virtual meetings give us, there is nothing quite like thinking with people in a room and just being able to pop up and be like, oh, I have this thought. Like, let me get feedback from you or write on this whiteboard. And so I'm, I'm really personally excited about that. But as a phase of development for the Institute, we are now moving beyond the idea of, of just being a synthesis center in the sense of learning what it takes. And we're transitioning both in funding mechanism. We're now no longer just an NSF funded center. We're supported mostly by UT, but also by the different grants that people bring. So if, you, so if you're a scientist and you want to play with us, come play. Um, but what we really want to do is leverage that learning about what it what it takes to to launch these beautiful transdisciplinary collaborations well and enable groups to be able to do that younger and younger in their science. So not just now the people who have been doing it for a long time and know how to do it well because they've been through the, the growing pains of having seen it done badly and to, now going like, great, we can learn from this and then deliver that process learning to other scientists and train graduate students and postdocs and bring in first year assistant professors and go, we see how to help you do this. If you're interested in being this person, you don't need to wait the three working groups of experience to figure out which groups you want to join and which are going to work for you and which aren't, or to envision that next grant that you might work. So we're, we're actually trying at Nimbios as an institute to set up support structures for scientists, not just to do their own research at Nimbios, but to help people figure out how to put together a proposal that's more speculative, to come talk to us and go, I don't know who I would partner with on this. Do you have, do you have people who might be interested in building something around this idea? Um, how, would we, how would we structure that? What do I do? Do you have opportunities for my students where I can send them to be trained in someone else's research lab in a discipline or as an interdisciplinary scientist? So to stand up those structures 
and support as an institute for that global community of researchers that benefits from the last decade of our experience being the researchers who got to get these insights by that experience because of NSF. Now, instead of going, okay, just what is the research? We want to enable the research. So we want, I'm still doing it. We're still absolutely doing the research. Um, but we're moving into a support institute structure also where if, you, if you're a scientist and you can't quite figure out how to pull that transdisciplinary idea into something coherent and articulable, we can help you do that. I even saw some teaching resources on the NIMBIOS site for, um, for like middle school students and, and oh, even absolutely. elementary school students. So, okay, so even more concretely, so you asked what I was most excited about, but more concretely, and thank you very much for the opportunity, um, NIMBIOS actually has some, some actual, not just teaching materials, but opportunities, especially for researchers who are writing grants and thinking about broader impacts and outreach. We have an entire branch of NIMBIOS called Easy as Play. And, and, uh, and our work with you um, to, to try and help researchers communicate what they're doing and, and help uh, get students who can envision like, oh, that is what math is, or that is what biology is, um, or that is what that interesting result from transdisciplinary research might be. So we have an entire person. So Liz Derryberry is our, our director of outreach and, and education. She'll be on next month. We're, so awesome. we're, we're doing, a, we're, just sorting out the order that I'm releasing these, um, but but uh, we'll be doing a NIMBIOS episode once a month with a different uh, NIMBIOS uh, researcher and collaborator. Awesome. But so, so hopefully she's going to talk to you about her cool research. She already did. It was a fantastic conversation and uh, I can't wait for people to see it. Awesome. I will be eager to see that also. But also in addition to wearing her amazing hat as a researcher, she wears the hat of director for outreach and education. And she works with Girl Scouts and she works with local public schools and charter schools and homeschool uh, parents who want to get materials for their students, for their children. Um, and, and she really acts also as a guide and bridge to researchers about how to, to frame and deliver those materials. So if you're a researcher who's starting out who doesn't know what to do for broader impacts and outreach, Come talk to Liz. NIMBIOS would love to help. If you're someone who's doing research, we're trying to offer all sorts of these support structures. Um, if you're someone who's doing research in spatial analysis and GIS systems and remote sensing, Mona Papesh is our director of our spatial analysis lab. And we've set it up so that researchers from across the globe can reach out to, to the spatial analysis lab, not just for advice and help, but also really for technical support. Um, you can come and have us be your consultants and we'll do that for you. And we're doing that also for mathematical modeling in general. Um, if you're an empiricist, if you're not a mathematician and you want to work with a mathematician and it's not really at the level of standing up a new collaboration, you just need like, I just need a mathematician to do the thing. That thing we were talking about a minute ago that isn't really transdisciplinary work, mm -hmm. but might lead into it. You can call NIMBIOS and go, find me a mathematician that I can essentially hire to be my modeler for a little bit to work with me on this project. And our hope, it is true that our hope is that that will develop into a full actual collaboration um, and true transdisciplinary science. But we just want to support getting mathematical modeling into more biological systems also. So, um, so people who aren't true transdisciplinarians but think math could be useful to them also call us. Uh, and we're, we're starting to, to do the same thing with data sciences and, and artificial intelligence. If you want a bespoke machine learning algorithm or something really cool in topological data analysis and that needs research, not just application, uh, we have uh, Vasilis Maroulis, who's an amazing researcher uh, in data sciences and AI. Uh, and he's our director for, for data sciences and AI at NIMBIOS. And again, reaching out to him and going, how can NIMBIOS help me figure out what my research should include about these things. Can you, in fact, maybe even do it for me if it's a one-off small thing, or can we partner to envision what we can do together if it's a bigger or transdisciplinary, synthetic, synergistic opportunity? Um, we want to be those people that, that act as like a matchmaker and a support system in a community. You know, every, every good community has that central hub where you're like, oh, that person just knows everybody and is kind of wise, and they might screw up and they might not be the, give me the right advice for me right now, but I'm always going to go to them because I feel like in general, they're the, the person who's going to help me think about my problem the best. Mm -hmm. NIMBIOS as an institute wants to be that to our community of mathematical biologists across the globe. 
Well, very cool. I cannot wait to have on the show more people within the uh, Nimbios community. I'm so thrilled that I uh, got to see you in person once again. And yeah, that, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, and then we got to uh, record another episode. Always wonderful to have you on. And uh, coming up, we'll we'll be doing uh, we'll be doing some more with Nina. I've I've talked with you guys about some of these working titles, casual courses that I'm putting together with some of my favorite uh, scientists and researchers. And uh, so we've been we've been chatting and putting together uh, something uh, related to that that will be coming out real soon. So. Thank you, Nina, very much for joining me once again. Nina Pepperman, everybody, and thank you, listeners, for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you next week.